everybody, and welcome to our session on the new platform economy. My name is Jonathan Zittrain. I teach on internet and law at Harvard University, and it's my pleasure to have this distinguished panel to start to interrogate what we mean by the platform economy and what it means to us. Platform is a word that can mean different things to different people. At the very least, I think, represented here, we have two kinds of platforms. One is the platform that is foundational to almost everything digital these days, such as the internet. Unowned, no particular CEO who runs it. It just sort of bizarrely runs itself. It's like a collective hallucination. It's wholesale as much as it is retail. It expects other people to build on top of it and other companies. And then we also have as platform a more retail conception and thoroughly owned. Um, and so I thought maybe I would start with you, uh, Nathan, Nathan Bacharczyk, uh, somewhere in the world who may not have heard of Airbnb. How do you encapsulate what Airbnb is? You come to Airbnb and we make it just as easy to book someone's home as a hotel. So uh -huh. you search, you see lots of homes that you can stay, all kinds of homes, extra bedrooms is one type of accommodation, entire homes is another. We even have tree houses and uh, that's the power of the platform, all kinds of accommodations. And when you book it, Basically, you're paying Airbnb. We hold your money until after you arrive, uh, so you know it's handled safely. If you need to cancel, something's not as described when you show up, you can call us, get the money back. Afterwards, you leave a review for each other. So in a sense, we've built a platform to facilitate things like payments, reviews, search, but we're actually not the provider of the ultimate service, which is the accommodation. So when you say we have tree houses, you mean tree houses exist, and we facilitate the person with the treehouse with the person who wants to sleep in the treehouse. Exactly. We're actually not the service provider. We're the facilitator. But we've, uh, we've really made sure that the facilitation we do speaks yes. to the specific customer needs. Now, this is one of those ideas that now that it's happening and it's 2016, seems like, well, of course. At the time you started, was there already burblings around this? Or was it seemed like fresh territory? We started it eight years ago, uh, and nobody thought it was a good idea back then. Uh, the obvious uh, thought was, why would uh, you allow a stranger to stay in your home? So fast forward eight years, to date, 70 million guests have now stayed in strangers' home, uh, just 40 million last year alone. So last year was more than the previous seven years combined. Let's look at this also then with respect to content and video. So. Uh, Susan, it seems great to turn to you now. Susan Wojcicki, CEO of YouTube. And I guess when you encountered YouTube, it was no longer just a gleam in the eye of Chad. Uh, so tell us about your uh, entry into YouTube. Sure. Uh, well, so YouTube was founded by, by Chad and Steve, as you alluded to. And um, actually, at the time, I was at Google, and I was running a competing service called Google Video. And we were competing with YouTube. And I, um, I realized running Google Video, the power of anyone being able to upload content and everyone all over the world watching it. And so I, I saw this trend is going to take off. This trend is meaningful. And there was actually one video in particular that I saw that was like one of the first user-generated hits. Um, it was of these two. Um, kids in their dorm room um, singing to the Backstreet Boys in, um, and their roommate is actually doing the homework in the background. <clears throat> and if you still watch this video today, I still laugh every single time I see it because it's, it's funny. And um, the views on it were just, you know, they were exponential. And I could see here you have two non-professional people creating content, but yet people all over the world want to see this. And so I was running Google Video. I realized how powerful it would be and we couldn't, I saw we couldn't compete effectively with YouTube. And so I was a big advocate of the acquisition. So YouTube acquired YouTube uh, very early on. YouTube was just less than a year old at that point. And why couldn't Google Video, run by a fairly large company that was conversant in tech, yeah. compete with YouTube? Yeah. I think it had to do with the community. It had to do with the fact that there were a set of people there who were watching it, a community who was in discussing and engaging in the videos. Um, and they also had really good product. I mean, they had a good product, a good brand, all of those components. And 
I mean, the kind of the logic that went through my head is, well, maybe we can compete with them, but this is going to be a really important market. This is going to be the future of online video, and there's a good chance that we can't compete, and do we want to take that risk? Yes. Um, it's really a much better decision at that point for us to make that purchase, and it was seen as really risky at the time. Yes. Um, I remember, actually, Mark Cuban put out this headline story the week that we were deciding to buy YouTube that said only a moron would buy YouTube. And here we were discussing, like, let's buy YouTube. <laughs> so it wasn't obvious at that time that this was a good decision. But I think given that I had seen the power of having creators all over the world create new forms of content, I saw that was important. I became a believer. And I thought it was really important for us to acquire. Let me turn now to Arun uh, Sundarajan. It sounds like both Nathan and Susan are telling stories of democratization that two guys in a dorm room with a third involuntary person just trying to get the homework done, or somebody with a treehouse can just a few clicks and you're on your way to reaching your audience or transacting with them. And I'd just love for you to tell us, is that the, the story here? The simple answer is that I'm an optimist. Um, I think that there is tremendous equalizing potential as we start to, and you know, what Susan and Nate sort of pointed to already sort of alludes to that answer, right? I mean, you know, people who wouldn't have otherwise had access to a global market now do. You're empowering the yes. individual to sort of build a small business. But now, a channel, a sociologist, or a pessimist, if there's any lack of overlap between the two, <laughs> uh, and tell us what would be an example of it exacerbating. Well, um, there may be a fear that as, you know, the network effects continue to um, sort of reinforce the dominance of a single platform in an industry, that um, perhaps that platform is now in a position to sort of capture a lot of the value that flows through it. I mean, I, I, that's the argument that's given. I find this argument fallacious because um, the kinds of platforms that, you know, these platforms depend very heavily on their continued brand, you know, the delivery of a high quality experience on the providers. And so it's smarter for them to view the providers as partners, as like, you know, sort of part of a community rather than as, you know, sort of inputs yes. to sort of extract rents from. Chuck Robbins, hello. Hello, how are you? I am very well, thank you. <laughs> you know, it, it's fascinating. I've been listening to the discussions and I, I thought about a few things. Number one, I think, I think we, we built the platforms that enable these platforms. And, you yes. know, this whole, everything we're talking about this week in Davos is something that we, we've been talking about for about eight years. And it's, it's just phenomenal to see it come to life. Um, the other thing I thought about is that we actually embraced, I think, the power of creating a platform even 15 years ago, because as I think about what you do is you, you, you create an ecosystem where value is shared across, there's tremendous benefit, you create loyalty, uh, you, you create stickiness. And I thought about one of the decisions we made early on that I think has, has differentiated us in similar ways in that back in the, um, probably about 15, 16 years ago, we made a decision to to really think about a global ecosystem around the, the platforms that we were building. So even today, we have uh, we deliver all of our solutions through uh, an ecosystem of hundreds of thousands of people that get up every day and they derive value from being a part of this, this interconnected system. Is there a specific example, like a day in the life of a bit moving along the internet or something? <laughs> well, I think the, the, the issue is that our platforms while we like to think that it's everything you need, there's usually other stuff that comes with it to actually enable what you guys ultimately try to do and what our customers try to do. But what we created was an ecosystem of, of value exchange. So partners integrate our solutions, they build applications on top of our solutions. Uh, we then subsequently created a set of certifications that created a broader ecosystem of, of you know, loyalty and, and again, value exchange where people built careers. So it's it's an interesting correlation to the economic and the benefit that you see from what you But know. just help us out here for a moment. Is what you're thinking about routers, you know, the, the basic building blocks that move a bit in the right direction when it could go in, in two different directions, it picks the right one. Are those the sorts of building blocks you're thinking of or something else? Well, I'm thinking about core, the networking infrastructure that runs the underlying internet, clearly. Yes. But the collaboration capabilities, the security technology, 
the mobility infrastructure that goes into service provider networks, all of that is part of this broad ecosystem that gets that delivers it uh, every day. And then we even subsequently created a global educational uh, network called Network Academies to create more people who are able to be a part of this ecosystem. So yes. now we're, we're transitioning all of our platforms um, to be of the flavor that you described. So we're opening up programmability on everything we build so that you can then develop on top of it, add value, build businesses on top of it, et cetera. So it's a, it's a similar yes. transition. Um, Pierre Nanterre uh, from Accenture, which Indeed. I believe has no headquarters. Accenture is in fact a totally distributed organization. Is totally right? distributed, virtual and digital. Do you know where you're going after the conference is over? Or <laughs> uh, is this sort of wherever the cheapest and, flight is? And, and maybe you might talk to my hologram. He's uh -huh. going to get on Airbnb. So t <laughs> touch me. Touch That's me. right, Airbnb. Might yeah. not be me. Yeah, yeah. So you've been listening to this conversation, and interesting threads here starting to develop around uh, competition, or whether there's a need for competition, where the regulatory thing kicks in. Susan's story of Google Video realizing time to get YouTube, what do you see either in the analog world happening, not just with tech companies, and what's your sense about the way in which companies relate to one another if they're trying to do something interoperable? Does that mean the competitors are not competing? What's, what's your sense of this? Yeah, I mean, we're living in a very interesting world where we are indeed uh, at Accenture when we're serving our clients uh, in their digital transformation of their analog business, if you yes. will, of, of their current business on how you emulate this platform concept, yes. uh, how you leverage uh, the technology of the different technology providers, including our friend from uh, uh, Cisco, uh, to create a, a, a platform economy uh, more around the industry. So here we talked a, ro uh, a lot around platforms that could be used by you, me, uh, consumers, to platforms which are more in the B2B uh, on environment. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, this week, uh, we are disclosing uh, our uh, uh, 2016 uh, technology vision, and it's going to be on the platform economy. And interestingly, just to give you some data and some facts, 80% uh, of the executive we survey uh, in that research mentioned that indeed platform going to be key in their growth strategy moving forward. That's the point number one. 75% uh, confirm that indeed the industry boundaries are going to be blurred. And to your point, they will have to cooperate inside their industry and even outside the industry on a cross-industry uh, standpoint. We've really covered a whole spectrum of platforms uh, in a brief period of time, ranging from the completely unowned and difficult to predict and have accountability for, like the internet, like the web, and like, as it is now, the blockchain and some of the uh, technologies and currencies built upon it, coming up through things like SWIFT that are collaboratives but have a form of governance that's within an industry or group of players that are otherwise competitors, uh, then moving uh, to uh, government regulated platforms like a medallion system for yeah. cabs or something. Uh, but the, and the one piece, again, represented very well here is just a really successful company that builds a business that snowballs and that offers great opportunities, but there's still going to be questions involving ethics, involving inclusion. I'm sure there are people that get really upset when their video is downvoted and think it needs to go back, or people on Airbnb who got, they'll tell you 18 ways in which they were unfairly categorized as a host or a guest. Do you think these things, and I'm asking, I, I guess Susan and Nathan to bring us in for a landing here as the, the operators, are these things digestible within the company or ultimately are some of these best done through some interoperable model or if it's governance of a kind, it, it ought to be government governance? I'm just, I'm curious how much the companies can, can take on here. Um, I mean, I think you're right. These are really hard issues and we, we spend time thinking about it and um, you know and we debate these issues internally so I, I don't want to buy I 100% agree and I don't want to trivialize it in yes. any way because it's a, these are serious and important and hard issues um, on the other hand these decisions need to be made um, quickly efficiently uh, Nathan did you want to I, I think uh, the key point I would like to make is that uh, this has to be an iterative process 
Yes. Um, just the development of these platforms have been an iterative process. Look at how much the internet has evolved over 30 years uh, and gave birth to all these new platforms, new opportunities, and new issues that have needed to be confronted. We're going to see that even in, in YouTube and Airbnb. Um, and, and so new issues will come up, and, and it will take time to find the solutions for them. I like to say that every week something happens that I never could have expected. Um, and you have to just solve them as they come. Sometimes it's not clear what the answer is. I think that's the issue that's difficult uh, when talking to regulators, yes. which is wanting all the answers up front, and yet you're doing yes. something new, and you're not even sure what the issues are going to be. And I would just say, as these decisions, when they are made by governments, often they are debated. It's under lights and cameras and such. I guess sort of a plea of sorts. It would be right. fascinating for each of you, and one of you does have a book coming out, the memoir, the iterative memoir, which has the 10 tough choices you would never believe we had to make before lunch. Yeah. My guess is a lot of people would be really interested to see the way you confront these really yeah. difficult We're, problems. I mean, I think one really important point to point out is we are global. And so when you talk about regulation, you usually talk about it in, in the context of a specific country. Yes. So if we operate in every single country of the world, um, you have to realize that there are different sensibilities in those different yes. countries. Yes. And so we, you know, one regulatory body also isn't going to meet the demands yes. of, of every country Which I in gather the world. YouTube was now back in Pakistan because yes. for Pakistani citizens, there may be stuff they won't see that others would. Yeah, so we just yes. re-entered Pakistan, which was, um, you know, it, it, took a, it took work for us to we get We would to love to see the chapter of that memoir. And we owe our panel a huge thanks for taking this really big topic and getting some movement on it. Thank you.